Zephyr.com. And I think we are joined by Zafar Benkash. Are you there, Zafar? Yes, I am. Hello, Phil. How are you? Very good. Uh, listen, congratulations. You spoke in Hamilton recently, and I heard it was standing room only. Is that true? That's correct, yes. We had the packed hall and about at least 50 or 60 people standing because there are no seats. So it was mm. a very exciting meeting, and it um, generated quite a bit of heat as well. But I think that's uh, what life is all about. Great. Well, Ed, well, you're designed for this. I know that. And, um, <laughs> and, Thank you. And I'm very encouraged, Zafar, uh, because in the first half of this program we talk about this. The war drums are being beaten rather heavily, and yes. there's something called the NDP debate, which apparently they've agreed not to debate, but they do debate. And no one talks about something which is very dangerous. Um, it, and... And, and so the fact that people come out and fill halls to hear you talk and warn them against uh, the threat of war and against sanctions and against this uh, belligerent attitude of the Western powers with their Gulf state friends, um, it needs airing out. I think the Canadian people, based on, on um, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy, they, they seem to be awake. I don't think they're asleep. They're being treated as if they're asleep, but they're not. Um, that's correct. I think uh, you, you touched a very important point. Uh, when we have a, an official opposition party and one that claims to speak on behalf of the little guy, the, 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 the poor man, uh, and yet when it maintains such deafening silence, particularly during a leadership uh, contest, um, unfortunately it doesn't uh, reflect too well on uh, that party. And, you no, know, and it doesn't say very much for our political culture. Exactly. That exactly. people say, well, why can't we just cut to the chase? Uh, do you think yes. that there should be these, uh, a war with the, Iran? Do you think uh, we should be arming rebels in Syria? Uh, yes, all, all, all kinds of um, terrible things are going on, and unfortunately, uh, the NDP is uh, missing in action. It mm -hmm. is not there. When we are expecting them to speak uh, on behalf of these issues, but it seems to me that they are trying to keep a head low mm -hmm. uh, when, in fact, um, the people of Canada voted for them and brought them to this position precisely because they felt that there was a party that spoke on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And as you said in your um, earlier remarks, that uh, today, uh, when whenever there is a program with respect to no war on Iran, and you have halls being packed with people and people standing uh, in the hall uh, mm -hmm. coming out in such large numbers obviously indicates that there is a great yes. deal of interest as well as concern among Canadians that there shouldn't be another march to war as there was uh, on Iraq and Afghanistan and the mess that they have created over there. Mm -hmm. And now they are beating the drums of war against Iran. So obviously it is uh, very uh, disturbing that uh, the major political parties are maintaining uh, either total silence or in the case of the, the conservatives um, marching lock, step and barrel with, with the Americans. Yeah. I mean, we know that the conservatives, even when um, the, the liberals had opted out of the war against uh, Iraq, um, Stephen Harper, who was at that time the leader of the opposition, he uh, condemned that. He said that uh, Canada should have gone to war uh, against Iraq. Uh, and yet now, now that he's the prime minister, he wants to take Canada into another war, disastrous war, that if it should come to pass would be launched on a pack of lies as, as it was done against Iraq. Mm -hmm. And no doubt with even uh, greater uh, negative consequences. And I can tell you something that, let's say, the Americans and the Israelis, of course, who are the ones pushing this, and the Canadian government, if they were to be involved in this um, illegal and immoral war, uh, let me tell you something. The Canadians had better be prepared for the fact that there would be the, the price of gas is going to skyrocket. Uh, there will be huge lineups at gas stations. And I can even foresee people fighting with each other to, to get gas into their cars. So I think we really ought to take this issue very seriously and not be pushed into... Uh, a completely illegal and immoral war, uh, which has absolutely no basis whatsoever uh, at all. 
Yes. And, and that's, you know, they were being, uh, I want you to speak to this uh, issue of how basically uh, the great powers manipulate the institutions in order to cause bad things to happen. For example, going forward with a resolution which was not acceptable, it was not going to work. Uh, it was known that Russia and China would say, you cannot interfere in the internal affairs of another country. You can't call up for someone to step down. That's not the job of the United Nations. And, exactly. if, you're, and if you're concerned about violence, you have to call on uh, end of violence on both sides. You cannot say yes. to the government, you stop. How could they possibly? I mean, yes. so, but they pushed it anyway so that they could say, well, look at that. The Russians stopped. Uh, and... Uh, and then I want to, to an aspect of that. They say, well, you see, the United Nations almost decided, and, and S- Syria is isolated. But I was looking at, at as I understand the map, uh, Ge- uh, Lebanon doesn't agree with uh, uh, ordering S- uh, Assad to step down. Right. Um, Iraq definitely does not agree. Uh, and, um, of course, there's Algeria uh, right. and other states. Um, so, and having, you know, Russia and China are not actually small countries, the last I heard. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, maybe we should tell, China explain also. that. China yeah. is also there, so it's not really a very small country, is we it? We should probably ask them to read uh, Tolstoy. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, how do they get to this position? I mean, uh, that resolution, what did you make of that resolution that they put forward? Well, obviously, it was that resolution was um, uh, pushed by the Arab League, which is, uh, of course, made up of these um, uh, remarkable democracies. You know, each and every one of them is a, is a you know example of democracy ruled by dictators <laughs> and tyrants. And they, you know, I mean, it's they have perfect that, democracies. Uh, absolutely, at, they because they're democracy. absolute monarch. They can't get better. Exactly. Yeah, they want democracy in every other country except their own. You see? So that's yes. how great they are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, when, when Russia and China, for this reason, and for very good reasons, actually, they had this experience in Libya. When they saw what happened in Libya and how the West uh, manipulated that resolution, which was essentially a resolution to prevent um, Gaddafi's uh, air force from bombing civilian areas, that basically turned into a free-for-all uh, bombing of Libya, its cities, its refineries, its schools, its hospitals, they were all targeted. <clears throat> and so essentially, that resolution was used as a pretext to go and uh, destroy Libya, and now Libya is in a mess. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, they wanted to do the same thing in Syria. I want to emphasize that obviously Bashar al-Assad is not a democratically elected leader, but I think the people of Syria realized that if they were to go down the route that Libya has gone, they would be in deep difficulty. They would be in great trouble. And so in that sense, this attempt that was made by the U.S. and its allies to try to push that resolution uh, to therefore interfere in, in Syrian affairs uh, didn't work because both Russia and China were not prepared to go along with it this time particularly Russia, because Syria is the only base that they have in the Middle East from which they can uh, exert some influence and keep uh, America from taking over completely in that region. But I think we also need to understand that what is taking place in Syria ought to be looked at in the larger context of uh, the Middle East and the U.S. Zionist uh, project for the Middle East. And, of course, we know that Syria is part of the resistance front. And so the aim of the Americans and the Zionists is to try to undermine Syria, thereby uh, undermining Hezbollah and Hamas uh, that are resisting uh, yes, Zionist uh, barbarities in that region. Yeah, the, in the New York Times, they carried a column by a former um, head of Mossad who said uh, it, precisely those things that, once we get Syria out of the way, we can finish off Iran, basically. Exactly. I mean, it's exactly. amazing. I mean, and, the st- and the New York Times carried that. I mean, then, then you say, well, maybe we shouldn't be to- entertaining all this silliness about how much everybody likes a- the rebel demand for democracy in Syria. Clearly, that isn't what this is about. That's correct, yes. In fact, uh, 
uh, this is this whole notion of democracy that they talk about is basically to hoodwink people in the West, uh, in, in their own country. I mean, otherwise, you know, obviously, neither the U.S. nor Israel or Britain or France can go around telling their people that we are in the business of regime change and we want to make sure that we destroy another country. I mean, they're obviously, they're not going to say that. Yeah. So what they say to their people is, oh, we are trying to promote democracy. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, most people would not oppose that. Of course. And they'll say, well, that's, that's a, something that we can go for, whereas, in fact, the truth is that uh, it is not democracy that after. It is basically uh, regime change and to uh, undermine uh, the resistance front uh, that exists uh, in uh, the region. I mean, mm-hmm. if they were really after democracy, I think maybe Saudi Arabia would be a good starting place. Um, they, they were not concerned about democracy in Bahrain. Yeah. Uh, they're not concerned oh, you can, about of course, democracy yeah. anymore in, in, you know, in, in Le- Libya either. They're not concerned about democracy in Jordan. So one begins to wonder whether it's a, a democracy project or is it really uh, mm-hmm. something else. And it is clear that it is something else that they're yeah. after. It seems to be, by the way, they almost... A- I think this Naomi um, Klein uh, has this theory about chaos. They, it's, it seems to be a chaos approach. In other words, if they have chaos, the only boss is themselves. And then yes, they exactly. say, well, well, we have to sort you folks out. Obviously, you can't get it together. You're all failed. You failed yes. your state. Therefore, we will be the state and, yes. and, and uh, handle matters. And now, a, a columnist in the Toronto Star on a weekend, actually, he, st- he wrote very candidly, this guy used to work for Al Jazeera, he said, um, well, we're going to need a corridor, and it's already being discussed. And as though we, the reader, you know, we're all in on this. Sure, the answer would be a corridor from Turkey into Syria. And he actually, with a straight face, said to deliver han- humanitarian goods. Yes. Uh, actually, they, uh, let me help him out. That, that's war. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> in, in fact, you know, they're, they're talking about as if, um, you know, that's, that's the only way that they can operate, that they can get foreign forces to come and um, uh, basically, uh, you know, interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. And now they are pushing Turkey to do that. And I think it's a very, very sad kind of a situation mm-hmm. uh, that they're pushing Turkey into. And uh, I'm, I, I'll be very honest, I'm personally very disappointed because I had uh, very high hopes of Turkey. Mm-hmm. Um, a few years ago, I thought they were on the right track, but it seems to me that they are also essentially playing uh, real politics, and they are not really uh, taking a either a moral or a uh, correct political position, because what they will end up doing is to create more chaos uh, for, uh, for the region. So in that sense, I'm very, very concerned about the position that Turkey has made. Mm-hmm. Um, this, uh, the, the forces that created the, the situation in Turkey with, with, that made uh, you found hopeful, yes. uh, they were, it seemed to me, I, I was watching from outside, but they appeared to be motivated by a desire not to be a flunky for NATO, and also they were tired of being humiliated uh, by the European Union, at whose door they keep knocking. Yes. And they and I thought the mood was, well, let's stop trying to join Europe and let's also stop serving NATO. And so those forces must still be there, and they must be very unhappy. Yes, they are. In fact, I was in Turkey a couple of weeks ago, and I found uh, that uh, among a large uh, segment of the Turkish population, uh, there was uh, great unease uh, of the manner in which um, the whole policy was being conducted. In fact, a number of uh, Turkish um, uh, writers actually uh, wrote about it, and and they uh, complained that Turkey has not really thought out its policy uh, very carefully. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think uh, that is a hopeful sign that uh, at least there are people in Turkey that, uh, that understand um, what the uh, what the situation is, uh, mm-hmm. and and how to uh, and, and how to conduct their affairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we 
we're speaking to Zephyr Bengash, Crescent-Online.net. Uh, Zephyr, we're having a little trouble with our our uh, connection, so we're going to we'll have to uh, sign off. But we're really grateful, and uh, you put your finger on all the problems we wanted to talk about. Okay. Thank you very much.